and that led me to Call of Duty. And then now I'm doing Call of Duty, brother. Do you know I'm a character in Call of Duty? I didn't know that. Dog, I had no idea how big that is. It was almost too much for me to imagine. I had a very simple way of looking at things. Look for the enemy and kill them and do whatever my team leader told me to do and stay awake for three or four days straight. So I learned how to be cold a little bit in Afghanistan. I learned to be colder in the invasion. By the time I was in Fallujah and Ramadi, I was completely a cyborg. You're taught the burden of leadership. And if you don't want it, that's fine. You can hide out, but if you want it, then you have to be the last to eat the first to get up, and every time there's something physical, you have to be number one. I'm hearing tracked vehicles and tanks in the perimeters of this area start moving, clink, 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 clink. Hell's bells, brother. Awesome. Yeah, Amazing. so that's a good little op yeah. uh, audience. Oh, I hope shit. you dig it. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant, and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent seven years on active duty with the United States Marine Corps as a recon guy, and then a follow-on 10 years with the State Department, which we'll get into. He's the founder of Force Blue, uh, which is an amazing nonprofit that helps uh, repair and restore <clears throat> a coral reef, and we're, we're going to get heavy into that. He was a military advisor and also played himself on Generation Kill. He is the superstar of SAS Who Dares Wins and Special Forces World's Toughest Test. He's the owner of New War Productions. Uh, he recently moved here to Dallas, and he's married to Jade Strzok, who uh, trained Halle Berry and John Wick, taught them how to do the John Wick business. He and her are the real-life Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Rudy Reyes. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Mike, for having me out here, my man. Yeah, thanks for coming, man. It's uh, we've been talking about this for a while, and, yes. and uh, you know now that you're here, makes it a little bit easier. What what is your spirit animal? <sighs> Maybe something slick and sexy like a panther. Yeah, but I also have butterfly wings. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to throw in like octopus or something. <laughs> totally out of left field there. All right, a panther with butterfly wings. That's right. We'll, we'll take it. A flying panther. Yeah. Awesome. What uh, What's the last full book that you read? The last full book? Well, man, I burned through all those Stephen King's. Really? Uh, oh, yes. I love Stephen King's stuff. Favorite uh, author? Uh, well, he's my favorite for for storytelling. Yeah. Um, the Outsider, about this, this nebulous, shape-shifting vampire that's been studied in different lores throughout human history who may actually be an alien and when it touch it or cuts you uh it can take your form but only for a little bit of time and then he will uh feast on little children because not only does he feast on their blood he feasts on their terror and nothing is more ter terrifying than that and then sets old boy or old girl up for the murder it's a good family story. Oh, bro. But, but, you know, of course, in the end, light overcomes the darkness. Uh, but uh, but there's, he just does such a great job building characters that you can relate with because he's very detail-oriented. And I've been a fan of his since uh, The Gunslinger and yeah. It. And I remember as a teenager, the books were a little bit heavier than I could understand because they had they went into some dark places, but um, it was the familial bond I had with the characters. Uh, it really, really just it really resonates in me. But I also love science fiction. Um, I love science fiction as well. I, I read all of the Dune saga, and then I read uh, things like uh, Blink and Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell, also fantastic stuff. I, I'm reading right now The Story of All of Us, a genetics book. Um, something else I recommend to everybody out there, Bill Bryson's A Short History of Everything in the Universe. I think that's the name of the title. And that's a great little, uh, you know, 300 page book that you can bring with you everywhere and learn really cool stuff about the universe and genetics and everything. So I kind of, uh, it's a cross pastiche of a, of a few different things that I like. I like to be informed. Um, and then I also like to go on journeys with story. Oh, that's great shit. Would you say that you read more than you watch TV wise? The, um, the TV I watch 
because there are some great productions now are things like House of Dragons and House of Cards. So different. Fa- Actually, they're not different at all. It's all political. It's all economic. It's all uh, uh, a balance between tyranny and leadership of your peoples. Uh, and then, of course, the corruption, the corruption in it. Uh, maybe the last great, great film I saw, well, a few of them. The Tom Cruise stuff, I love. I'll tell you why I love Tom Cruise. I just saw his last Mission Impossible. His ability to do the physical work, and I know what it takes to do it on production. What you don't see in the movies is that he's done that thing, whatever badass stunt and badass piece of camera, whether it's his motorcycle work or his his skydiving or holding his breath for five minutes while presenting the camera. Uh, He's done that probably 20 times, 10 times in rehearsals, multiple takes. It's a lot like what it takes to be one of us. We have to be so physically and mentally robust to rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and still stay fresh mentally and not say, oh, another tape house. Oh, no, we got to take it seriously. I really like Tom Cruise's work for that reason. But I recommend another movie called The Sound of Metal. And it is about a punk rock guy played by an Indian UK man. Who's, Ahmed. Yes, he's fantastic. What was it? Riz Ahmed. That's him, Riz Ahmed. And he's got this dilettante kind of sexy girlfriend that's the singer who's also, you find out, independently wealthy. And he loses his hearing. And his whole mission, his whole everything is wrapped around this girl and the band and he loses his identity because he loses his hearing. And he learns from a Vietnam veteran at a uh, hearing impaired house how to sign language. Bro, you're going to be blown away. It is so deep. And the brother that, that plays his, his teacher is a Vietnam vet. And I don't think he ever even acted before this. And it's so intimate about this guy losing his complete identity. Of course, loses the girlfriend. Uh, he can't hear his music that he's playing. And, uh, and I'll leave it at that. So, uh, so I do a mix of, uh, and I listen. I listen to Jordan Peterson a lot. I listen to podcasts. I, um, I try to stay informed uh, with what's happening geopolitically. And you can't help it right now in our country to be impacted by all of the cultural uh, strife that's happening. So that's kind of all happening in my world. Yeah. Uh, you're wearing a Marvel shirt. I can only assume yeah. you're a fan. Is oh, there a, a favorite Marvel movie of yours? <sighs> well, I'm going to take the audience back here. If you've not seen Blade 1, wow. My favorite <laughs> is when he does the sidekick. But like when he does the sidekick and then he looks at camera and goes, yes. Uh, little <laughs> things like that. It was way ahead of its time, but I also love Logan. Yeah. Um, I thought that last picture uh, that Wolverine, that Hugh Jackman did, wow. So you're more on the deep track Marvel stuff. You're yeah. Not, it's not default to Endgame or, you know, Falcon That's Iron really Man. good, too. And I, yeah. Iron Man was clever. The good. first one, the first one was, I mean, no one saw it coming. It was so yeah. good. Yeah. I also like that Thor uh the last Thor one that's Love and real. Thunder. Yes. Yeah, oh, my man. So, yeah, yeah. The, you know, it's all over the place. Yeah. Um, I love the deep stuff, the hard, heavy, deep, uh, you know, esoteric. And, you know, I'm crying a little bit because I've been drinking my freaking vodka <laughs> sodas at home. And I said, I'm holding on to Jade. Said, baby, he loves her. You know, that kind of stuff. And then I like the fun stuff, too. Yeah. Does she get into that? She does. Um, she, well, we're both students of, of, acting and media and production not just as as talent which i thought the first time i did a modeling job when they said hey relax the talent i'm like wow they think i'm talented (laughs) and then so this uh, this producer came this this producer uh, that works with the cameraman says uh you're a prop with a pulse so uh so it's kind of funny sometimes the talent in production world you you know you guys are hey just stay looking pretty or a prop with the pulse but we like we like to write and now we're producing some stuff too and we just appreciate when it's done well because we know the hard work that it takes i get that for sure um 
What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. What's your uh, favorite thing about life? That I have a relationship with my kids because for a while I didn't. Wow. Yeah, I was not well for a while. And now I have my kids back in my life. Now I can't post about them on Instagram and all that stuff only for their safety and benefit. I mean, I've already got weirdos and fans myself. So, uh, but, oh, it's so wonderful. Uh, I have my son back in my life and I raised him from like one to four years old and I was barely holding it together still doing some work in media still doing some contracting and uh, I'd just been out of a mental home for a year for veterans and uh, and it didn't really help much but it it gave me the strength that I could stay in there and not escape because a lot of people just escape Mm -hmm. it was veterans village of San Diego but I was not really well and I went to court I lost um, I, um, I was not stable so that I have built myself back and I was so, cl- you know, brother, I'll tell you what, there's, there's some people that say, some of our veteran brothers say that if you kill yourself, you're, you're weak, you, you are a quitter, you're a coward. I know from my personal experience that when you've hit so low and you don't have anybody in your life that really cares about you. I mean, they're all, they're all either tourists uh, or lampreys, like freaking parasites. And I was drinking and drugging really hard for some time. And, and just to give some context, I'd never even drank alcohol until I was 35 years old. But it was after service and then getting into the film business and then hitting this meteoric kind of rise with HBO for a moment thinking it was real because I'm used to having real relationships. And when everybody tells you they love you and how you've done so good and how important you are, I thought that was real. And it wasn't, it's, it's, uh, it goes, it's seasonal at best. And so, uh, yeah, I, I started drinking cause I couldn't ever sleep. And then, and then I started doing hard drugs cause I, I believe I like to feel pain to feel that I'm even existing. So, um, I was at the bottom, I lost my son. Shoot, I was, um, I got out of the court courthouse in St. Louis, freaking did a couple of lines in my car, fucking white knuckled it back. I'd probably been up already for two days. And um, I was drinking and, uh, and it's interesting. I never went to parties and I never, I never went out. Instead, I would just stay by myself and listen to music and just, um, just kind of, implode and I had my pistol I had my weapons I was very close to taking my life because I really felt like a letdown I felt like I let down my son um, and I have a beautiful daughter but I didn't have to go through this with her I felt like I let down my son also me being an orphan and growing up with a without a father I know what that did to me and 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 that I was somebody before. I've got a freaking chest full of medals and I'm a recon marine. You know, Um, I I came from poverty and and, and now I'm on the red carpet with with superstars at the Emmys. And yet I feel I don't have nothing together. So it was very, very close. But bro, I I don't know how best to explain it, but I... but God himself talked to me in words I can't understand, but just let me know it was going to be okay. Right after that, I had an inspiration that I have to take action. So I called my brother Caesar. I was living in Kansas City. I told him to come to the house, take all my guns. I flushed my freaking cocaine down the toilet, stopped drinking, took me a few days to get myself together, started working out again hard, and, um, and started that long walk back home to myself. A few years after that, I start Force Blue. Force Blue gives me the self-esteem and self-respect. 
and then I'm around all of us guys, and I'm seeing, oh my gosh, um, this is who I am. I don't have to be angry that I've lost it, or I don't have to be angry that I'm not this anymore. It will always be a part of me, but now I'm going to adapt it. And also, these other badass bros, my other freaking pararescue brothers and SEAL brothers and, and Royal Marine Commandos, they were all going through the same stuff I was. So I didn't feel alone. I generated steam, uh, got myself together, met Jade. I said, okay, now I'm really going to freaking straighten myself up uh, because I got I to gotta keep this woman, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, and so I got us a house. I, well, I got us a little crackhead apartment uh, close to Beverly Hills, uh, Hancock part. It was uh, about the size of a kitchen and it was like 2,700 a month. And, uh, we were there for a while. The riots happened and, um, uh, and I started getting some anxiety like, uh, you know, cause I didn't have my freaking, you know, team with me. I didn't have close air support and, uh, there were break-ins and there was a police car on fire three blocks away from our house. So, we freaking got on out of there and then eventually ended up in the South. And then now we're here in Texas. Yeah. So uh, I had a, had a television show going on History Channel, the raddest show, Haunted Battlefields. And it still may come back, but I did this pilot. Uh, I have to commune with the dead, right? So there's, there's ghosts at this freaking, I won't tell you all of it, but this heavy duty freaking bat, the, the furthest West battle of uh, the Civil War. And for for a hundred years, there's been there's been reports of hearing and seeing this ghost in this area. So I went and did a freaking uh, spiritual recon and and dug myself in six feet into the ground, uh, purified. I did a fast for two days, put in a long freaking tube for breathing, and it was freezing out there in the desert. And a storm came in. It was in the winter time. And I'm using my Shaolin Kung Fu breathing and using my freaking pranayamic breathing to keep myself warm. I have this vision. The ghost comes. Brother, I'm scared out of my mind. I, I, I claw my way out of the dirt. I've got my bivouac set up there just on some scrub with a tarp and, and some uh, flares. I've got my fire, firecraft all ready to go because I'm freezing, you know, and I have to get that fire going. And then I, I'm a painter and I'm an illustrator, so I draw what I saw. The next day, I get a, a face-to-face with the Civil War Museum guy that runs the museum there, and, and we talk about it. And it was super rad. It's bought by history. I'm back on, uh, you know, back on, uh, on TV, ready for the showbiz, got, get some money coming in for my missus and I, and then COVID hits. And so everything is just washed away. Um, and, then, um, and then we're broke. We were freaking broke, brother. And, uh, and Jade got me through about six months of being completely broke. And uh, then my knee flared up. Uh, I, took, uh, I was fighting in Fallujah. I was on the second deck, and we were taking heavy fire. It was just myself uh, as a lead element, um, my point man, and a machine gunner. And the rest of my team, uh, three more were in the rear, and then we had gun trucks. So we're taking heavy fire. We're, we're freaking uh, returning fire. We got to get off this roof. We get stuck up there. So I jump off ninja style, land, take a roll on my shoulder, super badass. But I felt a little pop in my knee. No problems for the next 10 years. That thing flared up. Now I've got a knee surgery. Now I'm depressed. Now I can't walk around. I'm broke. And what was the injury? Uh, it was just, you or know what? what? The repair? Well, okay. Now, to non athletes, this doesn't sound like a big deal. It was a meniscus tear. Excuse Bless me. you, brother. A meniscus tear to a non athlete, uh, it's not so bad. But to a guy who's using his body all the time, bro, the thing swelled up because I was still running sprints and kickboxing. Swelled up. The pain got into my hip, everything. So, um, Thanks to Gunnar Peterson, the Gunnar Peterson, the trainer of the stars, Stallone's coach, a dear personal friend of mine. Uh, I wasn't going to go to the VA because they might freaking chop the, the other leg off. So uh, he connected me to Dr. Uh, Ella Trosh, who is George St. Pierre and Kobe Bryant's surgeon, the best knee surgeon in the world. You know, I don't got $200,000 for this thing. Dr. Ella Trash says, don't worry about it. I gotcha. Wow. And uh, I was on crutches for about three months and did my rehab, 
but I was getting depressed. I gained some weight. I've never been fat in my life. And of course, fat to me means like 7% body fat. So I'm like, what the hell? I feel like a piece of garbage. I have no money. We're living in the worst place in Idaho. And, uh, and then I, Jade, she, she stayed patient and I got myself together. And then uh, SAS called and that brother the uh, last three years have been a roller coaster and it's yeah. been fantastic yeah that's well, a that's a long tail on the kite of what is your favorite thing in life yeah uh -huh. yeah yeah i guess so yeah. you know what uh and that i have my health and i have my kids and i got my family yeah and and i have my faith yeah bro uh, that i have my faith because i had turned away from it for quite some time. Yeah. And now, brother, I'm full on Jesus, full on God. I'm full on Jesus, y'all. I'm just letting you know. Yeah. Amen. Uh, taking a couple steps back, uh, I'd like to kind of go over your, your childhood a little bit. So you were originally born uh, in Kansas City? So? Yes, Richard Gabauer's Air Base. My father was a Marine. He was in Vietnam. My mother and my father are both from South Texas on the border. McAllen, uh, Edinburgh, Far, that area. A Mexican American, and um, my mother was visiting our other group of of Mexican family in Kansas City. We have a heck of a, a Mexicano community there because of the railroads and the meat packing that that was the that was a big time industry there for about 80, 80 years. So she was up there visiting relatives. Boom, I'm ready to go, son. She's seven months pregnant, but I'm ready to go. So she goes to the military hospital, Richard Gabao's Air Base. I'm born there. And then I'm between Missouri and Texas for some time. My dad comes back. They divorce. Uh, it was a very tumultuous time. Uh, so I lived in South Texas till I was about four, four, three or four. And... Um, you know, when we go to the Middle East or Northeast Africa and we're out there fighting and we're also interfacing and working with the people and how they're living, we were living a lot like that. We had um, outdoor plumbing. We had an outhouse and a water pump outside. This is, uh, you know, this is almost 50 years ago. Uh, dirt roads. And it was very old world. It was very Mexico. It was still very Mexico, you know. But... I was happy as hell. We had the fresh tortillas. I had the most delicious beans and rice. Uh, I learned to play with the, the wooden tops called trompos. Like I remember feeling so sophisticated when I was able to actually wind the string and, and get it to spin. And we'd play marbles and we'd play in the canal and chase frogs. And uh, so it was pretty, it was wonderful. And then I, I moved back up to Kansas City. I have two little brothers. We're all very close in age. I actually have a different biological father who's also Marine, who was also in Vietnam. I didn't know that till much, much later. But I always felt, because I'm the oldest brother and there's no man, I always felt the burden of leadership and I embraced it. I thought Michael and Caesar, Caesar's uh, underneath me and then Michael's the youngest, I thought we were, I was so much older than them, but they're only a year and a couple months apart. Uh, so I took that leadership position and... Um, and then we bounced around and then between Texas and from one like horrible ghetto to a worse ghetto to a worse ghetto. What did you, what was your mom doing at the time? You yeah. know, brother, my mother was, is a, a wonderful cook. She's great at, you know, starching your clothes and ironing your clothes, old world woman, but she had no education and, um, close to illiterate at that time. And she was just with one man or another, and then she got into drugs. And um, so she, she couldn't take care of us. And, um, and so I had to do it myself. And the best thing that happened to us is that we went to the Omaha Home for Boys. At what age was that? I guess I was, I got there by 11. And by then, brother, I'd already been abused. I'd been neglected. Um, I showed up, I had hepatitis, brother. I was almost freaking dead from hepatitis, from living in such horrible conditions. And um, I had really rotted out teeth. It was really, really tough. And I was very ashamed of myself. Like, you know, uh, if you can imagine going to, to grade school and middle school and your mouth is rotting so bad, it stinks. So you keep your mouth closed and you never want to smile. 
and then I didn't realize I was so sick. I just always felt sick to my stomach and I was kind of yellow, but I was still working out all the time. Like I go to the park and do my pull-ups and my dips. And I mean, I was always, always pushing myself physically because I love Marvel comics because, because no matter how hard life was, I could read the X-Men, I could read the Avengers, I could, I could read Spidey, I could read uh, Daredevil. And then I'd try to do those techniques that they were doing, you know? And uh, when I got to the, the boys' home, I got medicine, got my teeth you know, removed and uh, got some new teeth put in, uh, got a haircut, got church clothes, and uh, got a wrestling mat and, some, and a weight pile. Brother, the rest is history. How, so how long, uh, once you went there, how long did you stay in that boy's I, home? I was there till 17, and um, I tried to get out and go to an uncle that was actually here in Grand Prairie, um, and, um, and it didn't work out. And then I went to, to my mom and tried to make that work, but she was so checked out, and, uh, and it was a dangerous place. So I went back to the boys' home, and my brothers Michael and Caesar stayed there till they were 16 and 17 because when I became 18, I could emancipate my brothers, and I took Michael and Caesar out of the boys' home then, and they all lived with me. I had an apartment, bus tables, wash dishes at an Italian restaurant in Kansas City, and, um, and did some pizza delivery. And uh, what I did with my $35 a month is go to the YMCA for a family membership for like underprivileged people so that Michael, Caesar, and I could always work out at the gym. And, uh, and brother, I was a, s a straight and narrow uh, true believer. Work hard, work out all the time. I started doing Chinese Kung Fu. I'd been wrestling my whole time um, in middle school, high school, and lifting weights my whole time. And then with martial art, it gave me focus. It gave me something to believe in. It gave me responsibility because I had to eventually teach the young people too. And then I started competing, and then I started winning gold medals. And and uh, and that's why it's the ethics of martial art. It's the it's the character developed from that. Is why I joined the Marine Corps. I never. I never thought I was going to join the military probably because I'd been around so much gun violence being in the hood. And a lot of the people I grew up with, both Mexican and black, were gangbangers. And, um, and I wanted to be the antithesis of that. So I didn't want anything. I loved fighting hand-to-hand -hand because it was, first of all, it's fair. And you don't have to kill your opponent. You can beat them with ability and skill, um, but, but I, I, I didn't want to, I, I never really wanted to hurt people. That's not, I always protected my brothers and I would fight only to defend. And you'd be surprised when you're a young man, if you don't drink alcohol, you almost never fight because you're not in bars, you're not out late, you're uh, clear, clear minded. And I was always training. I was always training for the next, you know, tournament or the next kickboxing uh, competition. Um, but when Kosovo happened, I saw it on the papers on the USA Today that President Clinton was going to put boots on the ground. I said, wait a second, I am a strong young man and other men are going to go fight. It is responsible for me to do my part. So I joined the Marine Corps, 0300 open contract. Do you remember all those life insurance ads on the radio when you were a kid? Probably not because that was for your parents to worry about. Well, guess what? Now you're the parent, and now it's time to get life insurance to help protect your family. Fabric by Gerber Life makes it quick and easy to get high-quality policy uh, so your family is covered if the unexpected happens. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get high-quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policies in less than 10 minutes. You can go from start to covered in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. Join the thousands of parents who entrust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash mic drop, all caps, all one word. Again, that's meetfabric.com, M-E-E-T, fabric.com slash mic drop, all one word. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Assurance Company are not available in certain states. Prices are subject to underwriting and health questions. In today's crazy world with natural disasters, travel, pandemics, supply chain shortages, you name it. 
Jace Medical comes through with antibiotics uh, that you can just fill out a simple form and get online. They've recently added ivermectin to their list of uh, appropriate and available medications. Uh, and I will say, you know, I've, I've used this in a number of occasions, whether it's for uh, myself, family, uh, you can even use them on your pets. Um, make sure that you get the dosages correct. But, uh, you know, being able to, to order medications, antibiotics, ivermectin, et cetera, uh, is pretty key and, and extremely important. Um, you, you never want to get caught unprepared. Uh, everybody should be empowered enough to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. And Jace handles everything from online evaluations to licensed pharmacy medication delivery and ongoing consultation and care. Um, I can't recommend these guys enough for all your antibiotic and uh, emergency supply needs as it relates to those types of medications. Go to jacemedical.com and enter code DROP at checkout for discount on your order. That's promo code DROP at J-A-S-E medical.com. Uh, looking forward to getting into that. A couple, couple of questions about uh, the boys' home and, and kind of your, your teen years. Uh, did you go to a normal high school uh, during that time? And, and is it set up basically like an orphanage? Or how, how was the layout of that place? It was wonderful. It, it was still hard, to be, to, be, to be honest. It was still hard. You still have to fight a lot. You have to fight the other boys. Um, you can imagine a bunch of uh, grade schoolers moving into teen years, and there is competition. And uh, all of us came from really bad situations. So to, to be honest, we were all probably seriously depressed and were given up by our families or never had one in the first place or, or were, you know, we were all thrown away. So we had different houses, different uh, barracks uh, per age. And we had to do the massive lawn work. We did all the kitchen work. Actually, it was the best thing any young man with no family could, could uh, experience. You were taught to work and do your personal chores, so military, do your personal chores first, then hit the chow hall, and then work the chow hall, then prepare yourself to walk to school. So they did socialize us by going to, to civilian schools out there, but this was also tough, Mike, because we all wear the same kind of clothes, they're all donated, and, uh, and you're, you're known as a homeboy immediately, so you're a bit ostracized, and, and you know how tough... Uh, you know, the, the teen years are and, and all those things that are happening, you're starting to be aware of class. You're starting to be aware of money or what you don't have. You, um, you're starting to think about where do you stack up with your peers? Um, it was tough, but actually I'm glad, I'm glad we had to engage with it because it really prepared us for life. Cause that's how it's going to be. Yeah. That really is how it's going to be. And, um, my situation at, how I came into the home and how I was, you know, left to the wolves, that wasn't going to change. But my attitude, what I'm going to do with that could change and I could change. So I embraced sport. I followed the rules and I embraced sport. Was there um, any big influences in individuals in particular that, that stand out that you remember that you would kind of credit as being a big part of that, that period in your life? Yes, absolutely. The Dean of Boys his name was Bobby Orr. He had been given up at five years old and grew up there and then went to college and uh, became a success. And he was our president, if you would. He's also my wrestling coach. He spent a lot of time with me. Um, I eventually got privileges to go out into town. Um, our boys' home was at 52nd and Ames, and I would mow the lawns of the elderly. And the elderly would, you know, cook for me, and they would give me some money, and I would, and I would go to, um, I'd go to the drugstore, uh, and buy like sweet cards for my mom. You know, I was still a kid. I still, I still want, I still wanted to love my my mom and my parents. But eventually, over time, I had to just let everything go and focus on my own survival. Um, and that's something I still work on now. Uh, I've always been such an independent operator. Um, 
but it was Bobby Orr. And, and, and Mike, you're going to be blown away. I got invited back to speak at their 100th year gala anniversary. Oh. Holy smokes. I saw some of my old house parents, the Fishers. Um, I saw uh, my old librarian. And uh, I brought my brother, Caesar. And I was sitting next to the governor of Nebraska and the mayor of Omaha. And I, I did the keynote uh, talk and brother, everyone was crying, and then everybody was standing ovation, and we stayed up all night with all the boys, and it was really, really incredible. And and as tough as it was there, because you know you had to fight, and you know some the, some big boys uh, would, I mean, there was fuck. If you weren't ready and you weren't tough, you could be sexually abused too. I mean, it's freaking prison rules, you know. It's prison rules. You had to be hard, and this is where I got a, a bit of my hardness. And um, when we go fight in the Middle East, and we spend time in the Far East, and Northeast Africa, South America, only in America do we have boys' homes and orphanages where people actually care about you and get you fed, get you uh, medicine, get you sport, uh, you know, it's not like that at other places. It really shifted me. You know, the best thing about combat for me, the real, real gold of it was what a shift of observation, how I saw myself. I realized how blessed and privileged I was to have a, a, an American passport and to be brought up in the greatest military that's ever existed that rewards discipline, aggression, and a great attitude. You can go as far as you want in our world if you possess those things. And, um, and so th that was the greatest knowledge I got from combat was how blessed I was. Yeah, that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, do you ha did you keep in contact at all with your dad during that time? And now, as you sit here today, do you have a relationship with either of them? You know, um, my, my dad, who's got my name, Rudy Reyes Sr., Rodolfo Reyes, I spent a few years growing up with him, only a few. They were so impactful because I love them so much. I think every boy wants to love their dad. Every boy needs a dad. And I love him. I idealized him. He became a policeman and a sheriff. And um, But, you know, I can imagine now he was going through his own PTSD. He was really violent to criminals. Um, he drank a lot. Uh, he was a he was a loose cannon, which I can understand. Uh, he came back and found me when I graduated high school, and I hadn't seen him for five or seven years. And uh, and we had the best relationship until he passed. He passed about eight years ago, nine years ago. And um, I love him, and I I, pr I pray and, and and give all my love to him because I know I'll see him again because I didn't get to spend enough time with him and he was so proud of me, Mike. Every time, okay, so I I I'm the honor grad and Iron Man of boot camp, and then I go to SOI, which is a fucking ass kicker. Remember, you've not been in the military really yet. All you're doing is humping everywhere with tons of kit, and then fire and setting up firing lines and freaking running up hills, right? Running up hills and then doing your beans, bullets, and band aids once you get to the top. And, uh, and of course, I wanted to be the best. Uh, I've got my, my boot camp photograph at home, and Jade says, baby, you're so skinny. You know, you're very thin. I said, well, they starve you. And they said, well, why do they do that? Because they want you to be a certain size or shape. And they said, no. You're taught the burden of leadership. And if you don't want it, that's fine. You can be a regular squatty. You can, you can, um, you can be middle of the pack. You can hide out, but if you want it, then you have to be the last to eat, the first to get up. You have to do inspections when everyone else is asleep. You have to be up an hour early, making sure you're squared away. And every time there's something physical, you have to be number one. So I graduated boot camp, 150 pounds, skin and bones, but freaking Iron Man. Um, and SOI, just, you know, just freaking hard shit that I didn't know what I was doing. I'd never land nav before, brother. I'd been in cities and stuff. Thank God I had a Native American from Canada uh, on my squad to show me what the hell we were doing at night. But uh, somehow I, I become the honor grad there. And like uh, Marine Corps is so good at no 
good deed goes unpunished. So what do they do? Instead of sending me to a line unit, they put me on camp guard, which is the most dismal experience. I'm ha- I'm wearing a screaming high and tight. I'm like, well, Rudy, I guess you got a, sh- a dumbass haircut for the next four years. <laughs> Where you know, uh, well, maybe you'll you know, maybe you'll, you'll feel a lot better about yourself when you go to Kosovo and fight. So I'm in camp guard retrieving Marines running to Mexico, all kinds of guys going UA. I mean, you know, it's a really tough time. And I'm there for some time and recon comes through to Camp Horno to run the indoctrination. And and the corporal of the guard put a word in for a word in for me with recon for me to come out and try. And brother, it changed my life. I didn't go to Kosovo because then I I went to amphibious reconnaissance school in Virginia Beach. And then I got to the unit in California and then a whole slew of schooling just to be a basically trained guy, you know, Uh, you know, jump, dive, sniper. um, And then we had to do all of our workups, our freaking green to black side recon, our black to black, our urban reconnaissance surveillance, uh, and then all of our raid packages from the water and helos and everything. And so I was a junior man, schooled out when the towers were hit. We were on the 15th Mew and uh, platoon of recon brothers and a platoon of SEALs. We were on the same ship and our little EOD attachment. We deployed to Pakistan by air. First, we we did an amphib uh, insert to a place called Pazni. I, I don't even know where it's at. It's just some tiny, tiny, tiny little country or province where we can go as Americans. And then from air, uh, insert to Pakistan, got all of our kit and all of our stuff ready to rock and roll and all of our fast movers and drones. First time I saw a drone, 2001, I'm like, holy moly. And, um, and then the Australian SAS, and then we went and took Kandahar, and then we fought in Kandahar. Um, changed my whole life, brother, and uh, came back amazed I was alive after fighting, and and uh, and then the word on the street is we're going to Iraq, and the rest is history. Yeah. Uh, before we get into the Iraq, and I, and I would like to dive a little deeper into Afghanistan, the um, one thing that, that struck me a little bit about uh, your comments on your dad, I think it's... Um, Easy for a lot of people, and, and I, I would have assumed mm-hmm. um, that there would be more animosity towards towards your dad. And I, and I think most people in that same environment would have a disdain or, uh, you know, maybe a negative thought pattern toward yeah. towards him, given what you went through and, and his absence uh, primarily in, in your life. Was that something that crossed your mind? Did, did you talk yourself out of that, or did it just never... Did you just have that much respect for him that, that you just thought, you know what, I'll, I'll gl- gloss, gloss, yeah, gloss, uh, gloss, gloss over, over the it. fact that, that he wasn't there and, and you were okay with that? I think, well, I remember the first picture I ever drew really focused on was his dress blues boot camp picture when I was five years old, getting uh, all the buttons correct on his tunic and trying to figure out how to do the foreshortening on, the, on, the, on his cover. And uh, he was so iconic to me. And every memory I had of him, he had a duty belt with a gun. And, uh, and to be honest, he favored me more than my other two brothers, and I was not even his biological son. Um, I think compared to the abuse and neglect that I felt from my mom very personally, and I don't know, I think I, I just had to let it go. Uh, the last time I saw him, it was really bad. And I just had to let it go. I had to let everything go or else I wasn't going to make it. I was very sick and I was very depressed. I had, I think I was having psychological breakdowns too. I mean, imagine 11 or 12 year old, what they're going through when they've already been physically abused, sexually abused, uh, left to their own, very sick. And the world is a very scary place. Uh, I was falling apart when I got to the boys home it was it was a ray of light and i started eating all the time so lifting weights and wrestling and and uh i had a schedule um i just i just had to let it go um now 
Every time I'd come back from school, brother, when I came back from, first of all, when I went, made it to recon and then made it to ARS and, and you know, my daddy loved Gunny Highway. I mean, a seed, a seed, uh, uh, um, what is it? Heartbreak Ridge so many times. And I, I'd come home every time um, to see my dad first in Texas to give him my new t-shirt or sweatshirt, whether it was my combat diver, or my freaking sniper, whatever. He had all my t-shirts, all my sweatshirts, and he was the most proud of me. Uh, now, I, when I became a success, I guess, and, uh, with Generation Kill, I thought maybe it's time for me to find my biological father. Well, he had died when I was in Afghanistan. Uh, he came from a wealthy family. Uh, my cousins are surgeons, and um, one of my cousins was the assistant uh, district attorney in Austin. Um, really, really uh, highly educated Mexican Spaniards. All right, just on the other side, Monterrey and uh, through Matamoros, owned lots of businesses. Very wealthy people, very smart people. That's probably why it looks so European, because they're Spanish. Um, I met the family and brother. I thought they would be proud of me. Instead, they were very suspicious. They thought maybe I wanted money. And they were, they're very Catholic so a bit rigid and they um that my dad had a child that they didn't know about they didn't receive it and then when they find out i'm a recon marine and highly decorated they hate the marine corps because it they believe it took their son from him i guess after a second tour he was um doing heroin over there and did heroin the rest of his life, never worked, never anything, but they were so wealthy, they were able to keep him away in a, in a house. And um, I I've had no contact really with any of my family except my wonderful aunt, Dia Nilda, and I have a little sister who's probably around 30 years old now. And, uh, but uh, I don't know, uh, brother, I, I've had such a fractured experience with family except in the Marine Corps. Yeah, and that's why you guys. That's why my community. That's why my why my special operations community and the veteran community at large is so special to me, and why I try to be my very best to give some hope and inspiration to the brothers and sisters out there. Yeah. No, I, I mean it's a, a truly inspiring background and story you have. I, I think you know for me, my first thought in, in hearing you kind of outline you know your experiences growing up and and the tribulations that you went through with your mom it would be easy to kind of ascertain a, a hey what the fuck to your yeah. dad uh, yeah. of, of saying like hey mom was doing this where the fuck were you yeah. like why did you let us just yeah I think brother that would be too painful for me to do at that time I think it would be too painful uh, I, th I think it would just be too painful for me so instead, I looked for a father somewhere else, and I got it in Bobby Orr. Yeah. I got it in wrestling. I got it in martial art. I got it in the Marine Corps. I've been, I've been searching and, and finding fathers ever since until now, and now I'm a father. And, uh, and that's what I did. Yeah. That's what I did. Yeah, amen. Uh, relationship with your mom? I just started talking to her again, like, last year. Holy smokes. Um, Still so fired up, brother. She talks. She has a, a, a dirtier mouth than a freaking seal and a recumbering put <laughs> together. Uh, she uh, where's she, she at? She's in Kansas City. She's now getting old, so I'm gonna take care of her. And um, I think I think since I lost my son Dylan. And by the way, my son's back in my life. I get to see him for the first time in November. I've been FaceTiming, FaceTiming with him for about three years now since I've become more successful and I'm able to take care of child support and sport and everything. Uh, showing the family I'm dedicated. Um, they're Asian and they're very successful. They're educated doctors. And showing how dedicated I am. And... Um, and with the strength of that, and, you know, like the king of Jordan sending my son birthday cards and photos, you know, yeah. I, I utilize every bit of that swag I got from my family. Sure. They deserve it. Um, I healed enough to start working on that relationship with my mom. Jade will tell you that, that the healing that she's witnessed in the last five years with me um, 
it, it's been nothing short of a miracle. You know, she's heavy in the faith. I was too angry and too depressed or, and too ashamed of myself to accept God to love me. Um, I always thought I had to compete for everything I am and everything um, I am known to be. I must compete and I must hold that razor's edge or, I, or else I'm just not worth it. Or So I couldn't accept that grace and, um, and the forgiveness. And slowly, as uh, I started repairing myself all along, get, you, brother, I've been in some heavy ass firefights and heavy ass stuff. I, I know you know what I'm talking about. And the freaking bullets are just going, whoo, whoo, you know what I mean? And I'm hitting right on. And, 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 and there's so many, uh, you know, I had an RPG, brother, shoot right here. And it was just right across the canal in Iraq. So, you know, you got the hardball raised up. So you're freaking, uh, you're uh, totally skylined. And then, uh, then you got a canal that's too far freaking deep for the Humvees to go through and right on the other side uh, behind some uh, some vehicles right before and I just done three days uh, put clandestine patrolling through the Euphrates and then sniper missions and it was and people don't know Iraq in the winter time and in February is freaking freezing cold and if you're doing overt stuff during the day and you're sweat soaked and then you gotta lie up at night and and you're freezing brother um, and I got extracted. The sun was coming up, and we're heading back to the hard base, the Mac. And uh, I saw s this woman in black and a child running this way, and I just had the wherewithal to look this way. And in those days, we didn't have – we had completely open Humvees with just the half-armored doors. And um, the, uh, the RPG, it went flying. It, I heard the boom, and then it went – right in front of my heavy gunner with the gooseneck, right? And right behind my head and boom. So, all, man, I've been, I've, I've been looked after my whole life. And, and then and Jade reads the Bible every morning. And sometimes we fight all the time because I was so nihilistic. So there cannot be anybody that loves me. You know, there's no way you have to earn you know, what about children, little babies that, uh, that haven't had a chance to be baptized or are uh, uh, or, or born in the Far East and uh, they're born Buddhist? Are they not going to heaven? So, you know, I had all this anger because I wasn't ready to forgive myself either. These, these, these things started healing. And when that started healing, I started being more available for everybody that really is important in my life. And my... You know, my mother could pass tomorrow, and I'm not sure if I'd cry, but my, by me being there for her, um, I'm being there for everybody, and I'm more uh, involved with my relationship. I'm sharper with my work. Uh, I can say no to things now because I'm not in a space of emptiness. Um, I feel that everything is just as it should be, not that you become lazy. Yeah, but that everything's where it should be. Yeah, I think that's a good good mentality and attitude. It's easy to be guilty of what I think a, a lot of just human beings in general general are, but especially you know Westernized society where you know we're either living in the past or worrying about the future and, so and never present. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think uh, that attitude of not just complacency of like, well, it is what it is and I, I can't do anything, but just being okay and content with, with where things are. It doesn't mean you don't strive to get better, but you've got to like first be good with, with what's going on, you know? Uh, yes. Yes. You, when you look in that mirror, you have to actually have some respect. Yeah, there, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yep. I mean, if it, like n nobody's going to respect you if you don't respect you. So you know? true. So, so true. Yeah. Um, I, I do think there's a fine line or, or there needs to be a difference between self-respect and arrogance. And sometimes, Absolutely. sometimes that's gray for, for some folks, but yes, but uh, yes, real self-respect I think is, is really driven from immense deep work on oneself. Um, you know, you really got to work deep on yourself. Uh, are you fronting in any way? Are you fronting? Um, are you a man of your word? How do you speak to others? More importantly, how do you speak to yourself, the language you use, even in your head? And are you in a constant state of saying praise to Father 
uh, to, to saying praise to God about everything that you've been gifted and how blessed you are and how much work you must do, the real work. Yeah. Not just the freaking uh, glamorous stuff and not just the famous stuff, but the real work, you know. Um, not losing your freaking cool when you're when your woman gets on your case about something, uh, not, you know, not calling your agent and saying, where the, where the F is my money? Not, you know, instead, where, hey, come on, short time here, long time in heaven. Make it right here so that this is accessible. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's uh, it's never ending. Never, yeah. Yeah. no. It's and I kind of enjoy it that yeah. every day we got another day to practice yeah. being yeah. awesome inside. Well, I think there's a parallel between you know, especially being in like special operations units where you know we had a saying, "Earn your trident every day." That's right. But I think the same is true with yourself. Like you've got to earn your own self respect every day. That's like, right. It's not like okay, I have it and now I can let go. Like you, you've got to continue to to be the example and and you know st- at least strive to to be what your expectations are, you know? Um, yeah, brother. J- just going back to your, so have a relationship with your mom. Do you mind if I ask, is, is she cleaned up? Uh, is she Is she at a point in life where she's relatively good to go or? Medium. Yeah. She's medium. She's not going to change. Uh, and oh my gosh, she's a, a drama queen, but she's also hilarious. I mean, I put her on speakerphone when I'm talking to her, and oh, mijo, mijo, you know, it's my my arthritis, mijo. Oh, but uh, and I said, well, mom, have you thought about cleaning up your diet a little bit? And and um, Jade and I, we make uh, taquitos with turkey. Oh. That's sacrilege. Tur- turkey yeah oh it has no, it has no flavor me oh, tastes like cardboard no i'm not doing that i said well you know she's just out of control brother you know what my personality is big i must have got it from my mom because hers is up there brother <laughs> has she met jade she loves jade yes yeah, she uh so we all got to see each other for thanksgiving and and it was wonderful. And you know what, brother? I was I was a hard ass for the first 10 minutes. And I think all that childhood was bubbling up. And then somehow, I think it was Jade actually calmed me down. And then I just let it go. I just let it go. Um, uh, I don't need to hold it anymore, you know? Um, and Jade loves her. She loves Jade crazy. And, and she's always asking to come here to... Uh, Texas and Jade's like, well, I don't know about that yet, but, yeah. but we'll baby see. Steps. Yeah, yeah. Baby steps. Yeah. We're brought to you today by Manscaped, who has taken a step up from Balloween to bring your face the cleanest shave it's ever seen. So this season, no need to toil and trouble. Manscaped's all new handyman is the best way to get rid of that stubble. Now you may think to yourself, this dipshit has a beard. What's he talking about? I still have to shave my neck uh, to which the handyman does a fantastic job. It's featuring a compact design and next-gen skin-safe technology. The Handyman was designed to give you that smooth finish without the mess of a traditional shave. Get the sweetest treat this Halloween by going to manscaped.com and use the code MICDROP for 20% off plus free shipping. Are you tired of the bad razor making your neck look like a scary movie? The Handyman skin-safe technology will help reduce nicks and cuts. You can finally feel confident when going for that close shave. For wet or dry use, Bring it anywhere and everywhere, compact design, airplane friendly. It's a perfect travel tool for on the go, and you can shave up to three days worth of growth without the mess of the wet shave. If you've got, you know, the Wolfman action like I have going on and a little more scruff, the Beard Hedger Pro Kit has everything you need to tame that mane. It's a cordless trimmer with a rotary wheel that gives you 20 hair cutting lengths with all in one guard. So no more drawers full of extra add-ons collecting cobwebs and pubes and God knows what else. Halloween costumes may take effort, but beard grooming doesn't need to. 20 different beard lengths just in one guard. That beard hedger is a high-tech piece of art and a travel size package with a long-lasting battery, universal charging, and one hell of a strong motor. Again, go to manscaped.com and insert the code MICDROP for 20% off. Manscaped has been uh, sending us products for a long time now and has been a staunch supporter of Mic Drop. Please go check them out and support them as well. You know, all the time that I've been alive, the U.S. dollar has always been the primary currency, but that may not be the case much longer. China is set to dethrone the dollar uh, probably sooner than we all think. All of the world's biggest economies are ditching the U.S. dollar for the yuan. Collapsing U.S. currency is causing unprecedented inflation and crashing markets, which you see around us all the time. 
If that's not enough, it paves the way for the government to take total control over all your money with a new digital dollar. Take control of your savings and don't let your life savings become a casualty of currency wars. Now is the time to call the only precious metal dealer I trust, which is American Hartford Gold. They'll show you how to protect your savings and retirement accounts by diversifying your wealth portfolio with physical gold and silver. With the finest products, amazing customer service, and a buyback commitment, American Hartford Gold has a five-star rating from thousands of reviews and an A-plus from the Better Business Bureau. American Hartford Gold supports content like the Mic Drop podcast, and it's committed to bringing you the truth, hence supporting my show. Uh, Tell them I sent you, and they'll give you up to $5,000 of free silver on your first order. $5,000 of free silver on your first order. Call them now. Click on the link in the description, or you can call 855-967-1413. That's 855-967-1413. Or you can just text the word DROP, as in mic drop, to 65532. Again, that's 855-967-1413, or text DROP to 65532. Uh, okay, so getting back into you went to Afghanistan first. Um, the could you kind of synopsize what what the fighting was like? Because it was early on. Can, yes, it can was. You, if you could kind of walk through, sure. Like w- when you guys got there, what what the big mish was, kind of sure. what, what your orders were, and, and kind of how that deployment went. Sure, and you know, all these freaking devil dogs and all the senior guys and and. Or my SEAL brothers, all of they're like, yeah, freaking Westpac, Libo, you know, freaking Thailand, do a little desert stuff. Uh, and um, I always had a feeling something was going to happen. So we had just left Hawaii where we we passed, left Hawaii, did some rad jumping and diving and some patrolling, and then um, got to Australia, did uh, some counter smuggling stuff with North Force up in Darwin, and then uh, on to Team War to do a peacekeeping mission. Did you, so was this in, uh, this was in 2000? 2001. Um, because that, like that, I guess let me ask, were, were you on a fast catamaran by chance in, uh, out, of, uh, out of Darwin with, with some seals? I did. I I got with the freaking Swick guys and some seals, because, because, and 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 uh, and, and I, myself and another brother uh, Emilio. We were the only two recon guys because we're the cool dudes. All my other fucking uh, recon brothers are <laughs> like, man, fuck the seals. You know, I'm yeah. like, no, these dudes are awesome. We're working out all the time too. They said, hey, do you want to come on out on this freaking boat? And uh, oh, had the freaking time of my life, yeah. brother. But when I got back to the bear, the little birthing. Yeah. <laughs> Are you ready for this? These motherfuckers. I got back to the birthing. On the, you know, you got the table that's bolted in and the four the four little stools bolted in and all the racks are down there. And by the way, this is this is freaking five star living on the ship uh, compared to general what ship population. Was it? it was the the Dubuque. The Dubuque okay, so, uh, small deck. Yeah, so I think you and I were on were on the same fucking Ma- deployment. Maybe w- w- really, yeah, brother. Yeah, so I was on the Duluth. Right? Okay. At which we went out with the Dubuque yep. and the Mount Rushmore. That, yep. that was the uh, the the Amfig Amfig Fib group. Jesus, I can't even yep. talk. But we went to Hawaii to Australia, um, and same exact thing. We we worked with the Norforce guys in Darwin. We tested a fast cat. Ended up doing a Neo in East Timor. Yes. And then uh, s- jumped on the fucking USS Bunker Hill and and hauled ass to Bahrain. We were in Bahrain for a few days, and then the coal got bombed. So we jumped on the Tarawa. You, you were on the one right before me. Okay. Yeah, that had just happened. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. That you were. Um, I had some recon brothers that were that were on that op yeah. or, and on, on that freaking uh, that float. Yeah. Uh, sa- same same, same gig. Yeah. Same gig. And God, um, crazy, man. yeah, brother. Small well, you know, work. that's what we were doing back yeah. in those days. Yeah. And, um, and when the towers were hit, we went, uh, you know, all fucking systems go to, uh, the Persian Gulf yeah. and we're getting orders and, uh, getting all our bang, getting all our freaking pyro, getting all of our ammunition, filling radios, rehearsing, doing a lot of shooting on the flight deck, freaking pra- practicing our, fast rope inserts in the this is the most dangerous shit i've ever done in the uh <laughs> the elevator shaft yeah. and the freak boats going, we're fucking banging it. We're, you know what i mean <laughs> full kick going down the five-story yeah. elevator shaft yeah. for our fast rope and, and uh and so we we hit pasney and from there 
to a place called Jacobabad, flew in there, held in place about three weeks maybe, living hard. Uh, first of all, much love to my Marine Corps infantry. Those brothers are always living in holes, yeah. brother. We're living, you know, in a in an aircraft hangar, and it's um, and we're and we're prepping, and and then I'm doing my first counter recon kind of counter sniper patrols in Pakistan, uh, and it's just ramping up. And man, we've got tons of Brits coming. We got the Aussies coming. So boom, we get the word. Now we're gonna go take uh, take go to this tiny little fob that we would call Camp Rhino. It would later be Camp Rhino. And um, Rangers and uh, and Spookies and Spectres hit it from the freaking sky and then went down and, and mopped up. We got there after that, freaking mopped up some more. And it was a heroin factory and uh, a m massive warehouse. And immediately... It was us, it was the SEALs, it was Aussie SAS, some EOD, and uh, some probably ground branch style dudes. So is this late 01 or early 02? Or? This is late 01. This okay. is September, October. This is by October. Yeah, so I could. Yeah, right very. Away. Yeah, right away, right away, brother. And it was. Uh, Fuck, we didn't even have hel helmets, brother. We were, remember we used to wear <laughs> the big, protex. yeah, we'd wear the big freaking um, uh, H harness recon rigs yeah. because we'd have to do reconnaissance. We'd be out there yeah. freaking five, six days. Uh, I didn't know how to drive a Humvee. I didn't have a Humvee ladder, and we didn't have any Humvees, so we took them from Com and took them from some other people. Uh, some cats had some IFAVs, uh, and we're like, holy shit, man, this is a whole new world. Uh, all of our deuce gear and all our rucks and everything were all OD. So being the freaking sharp camouflage dude I am, I love camouflage as an aesthetic. I was really I into being a sniper. I, I found some flour that all the locals had used for their naan or their bread, and I made a paste, and then I made some freaking paint, and I brought some sand, and I camouflaged all our stuff. Um, and we were getting grids of freaking 60k 70k movements massive grids that are our area of operation of a five-man team and we're gonna we're gonna patrol i'd never freaking driven a humvee now i got an optic on and, and you know the terrain out there uh, you can drive off a cliff like that and and of course there's bad guys i'm, I'm you know i'm scared to half to death and I'm the junior guy in the freaking team. And uh, we're all freak, uh, three of the five of us are scout snipers. I got a ranger. I got, man, we've got a stacked team, but I'm a junior guy. And um, I'm in charge of the route. Do you remember? I'm sure you do, Mike. Um, the days in which your acetate overlays for the map for yeah. your uh, your freaking insert and then your secondary and then your patrol route and your on call targets and your dar site. So I you know I had to lickety split do those up really good and fucking give it to the freaking jock and uh, and coordinate with my my seal brothers and my uh, SAS brothers where we're going and then we're out brother looking for bad guys. Uh, move into a mountain range find some uh, defilade, dig in the vehicle, camouflage the vehicle, rock up, and we've got every freaking radio known to man, um, and uh, tons of batteries and water, uh, hardly any chow. You don't bring much chow. You don't need it. What you need is tobacco, and you need some water. And uh, <laughs> Breakfast. Yeah, yeah, brother, and, and some freaking uh, uh, instant coffee, baby. And... Uh, and we patrol up into a mountain range and then set in. And now we're running observations. We've got drones. We all are running cast too. We're all TAC P's, um, JTACs. We had to go to school in Yuma. And uh, we're interdicting any and every freaking truck running through there. You're, you're actually stopping them or just observing them? Uh, observing them, shooting them, and then dropping <laughs> air on them. <laughs> Everything. It just every technical, so every... The Every technical in that AO, yeah. So, I mean, did they have to be armed, or, or were you guys assuming that if they're coming and going from a heroin factory, then they're just clear? You're cleared hot and fucking lighting them up. We were always on observation, so we always they always were armed. I got so, you. yeah, it, if it was clear a civilian vehicle, but there there just wasn't any traffic except you know the Mujahideen. Yeah, so you're just fucking drilling these guys, drilling them, brother, and then dropping freaking uh, hellfire on them and. Um, 
Were you, were you guys going in and doing any uh, BDAs? Su- su- yeah, any. Yeah, we do the battle damage assessment, and uh, and then collecting all uh, you know collecting on everything, and uh, there was only twenty of us, so there'd be two teams out of five at a time, and then ultimate push to Kandahar, and same same except this time we brought the infantry with us on tracks uh on trucks and uh, linked up with green berets and seals and i guess like see brother i was a young i was a young recon marine back then i didn't understand how the real nor did i need to know the real big picture i didn't need to know that i needed to know what i needed to know and do it well um uh, there were dudes that looked like me and you Right? Dudes that look just like me and you with the shit hot ass weapons that were even more shit hot than our weapons and looked really clean. And, but I could tell they were, you know, you know, fags, former action guys, because they were so cool and they were still fit. And the way they talk to you, engage with you, it's almost like they're looking at a younger version of themselves. And I run into them. I ran into them at our command post in Rhino. Uh, they were all over in, in Kandahar. Which, by the way, Kandahar is called Kandahar because that's the furthest north that Alexander the Great, Alexander is where they get the word Kandahar. That's the furthest north that he had, he had gone. And, um, and so there was stuff going on, bigger picture. I just did my, my recon sniper and uh, close air support patrols and then set up firing lines too. Um, it, it, was, it was so big, even though there was very few of us fighting, there wasn't a lot of us, but what was going on globally, I had no idea. I didn't have any idea about anything until almost a year. That deployment lasted almost a year till I came home. Holy shit. We were there in Kandahar and took by force the monkey bars place. It was on all the propaganda. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I had no idea, my Uh, man. Holy, oh, I got another thing. Gosh, I can't believe this. this is like 24 years ago. 23 years ago. Um, Johnny Walker Lind. Yeah. Some Green Berets, I think, or CAG. Oh, by the way, in Rhino, then Dev shows up, but they really look like me and you. And I thought, you know, who's this camera crew uh, uh, or National Geographic expedition yeah. going on here, right? Because they, yeah. had, they had some really cool National Geographic style clothes and, yeah. and even had some color and uh, longer hair and, and, and very chill. So there was a lot going on. And by the way, our ISO areas, we were just running 550 cord and then putting ponchos up. And, uh, you know, we had uh, recon and seals, dev. SAS, I think even maybe CAG came. Brother, I was very focused. I was a junior man. I was focused on my routes. I was focused on my training and always um, working on our guns and radios. I mean, and PMing because it was really dirty out there. Uh, I just remember in the periphery noticing all this. So Johnny Walker Lind was wounded by, I think, Green Berets or CAG or, or Ground Branch. I don't know. Um, but they were given to us. And, and we, and he looked full on Mujahideen. Yeah, well, and, and real quick for the listener that if you're not familiar with the name Johnny Walkerland, it was an American citizen who was a, a white kid yep. who was fighting for Al Qaeda at, that's at the right. beginning of the war. And it was a big propaganda tool. And uh, so just, just for some That's background. exactly right, brother. Um, you know, I thought he was Taliban, my man. And he, we're taking shifts guarding him in this Connex box. And then he's going, um, then I hear, uh, oh, I'm so hungry. Can I please have some food? I think it's one of my homeboys fucking with me around the Connex <laughs> box, fucking throwing his voice at me. I'm looking around. What is going on here? Sure enough, he's American. Couldn't believe it. I'm like, what in the wild world of sports am I a part of right now? This is a, you know, that I'm in this strange piece of history. How did you not wring that fucking guy's neck? Like, did you guys... He was already wounded pretty bad and fucked up, and we definitely starved them. Um, 
brother, I was so I followed the rules and I was a, remember I was a corporal, my man. Just did whatever the freaking team leader told me to do. And uh you know what I'm yeah, saying? No, I mean I, I get that. I guess <laughs> you know, like also thinking like that was a very different time as far as, you know, nine eleven was fucking fresh. Yes, it was you know, super like, fresh. Like the, the mentality of our countrymen was very different than yes and, it was and being there in that first you know yes. period or wave yes coming across an american caucasian citizen that's yes. fighting for the taliban slash al-qaeda like i don't yes. know yes in some ways mike actually thinking about it it short-circuited my brain i really couldn't imagine that's what this is i hadn't i i i, I would never imagine that one of our own people would be committing terrorism and fighting us. Uh, it was almost too much for me to imagine. I had a very simple way of looking at things. Look for the enemy and kill them. And, um, and do whatever my team leader told me to do and stay awake for three or four days straight, right? That was, <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and something else that would happen later when I was in Iraq the first time. <sighs> I was still learning how to be cold. So I learned how to be cold a little bit in Afghanistan. I learned to be colder in the invasion. By the time I was in Fallujah and Ramadi, I was completely a cyborg. In Iraq, on the invasion, halfway through, and we'd had some freaking casualties. Thank God nobody killed. And we killed a lot of them. And uh, we all had dysentery by then. Um, and there were some tanks dug in to ambush us. This is the initial invasion? Time. Yes, the initial invasion. And we were leading the whole 1st Marine Division. We were 30K ahead of everybody. We didn't have nothing out there. Oftentimes, oftentimes no close air support either. Uh, recon by fire. We engaged them first. We freaking schwack these tanks. We kill many of the Iraqi soldiers. And then one of them was alive and, and gave up. I took control of him. And I'd already, I'd already wounded some other people in battles before then. And, and I was... I wasn't compassionate. I wasn't compassionate. Also because I had just got out of hot blood firefight with these guys. This guy, he looked so fucking demoralized, and he was an old man, he was chubby, or he was probably not old, he was probably 35 years old, but he was chubby, and you can tell he had nothing in him, and he was scared, brother. All of us freaking gorillas, all of us psychos, he was probably thinking we'd treat him like Saddam would, torture him a bit and then cut his head off, right? And we didn't. We put him in a truck, you know, we had him zip-tied his hands, and then I got him some water, and then got him some some water you know um I, I still had that piece of humanity left in me still i hadn't been it eventually it goes away is what i'm saying but the last one and we got brothers being killed and and um and it's a 360 degree threat and it is absolutely hell on earth even though sometimes i had the greatest time of my life i thought because i never thought about dying um that that uh, that cyborg took over. It had to. I could have no more humanity for anyone there. And the humanity I did have for these wonderful Iraqis who were Christian, by the way, that were helping us, eventually um, they were um, caught, uh, tortured, and beheaded. And I think that's, I know it's jumping ahead, but it was in the end me doing so much, I thought, great work of killing these really dangerous evil people in which oftentimes they have the drop on you it's their backyard and uh, we defeated the whole ied threat in freaking fallujah by doing continuous um, overt patrols during the day melt into the bush at night and then covert patrolling sniper missions and interdictions with gun trucks and and uh close air support um I, i'd done so much but the family that I was working with who wanted nothing but a paved road so their children don't get sick in the dust walking to school. They didn't want money. They didn't want 
uh, supplies. They didn't want anything. They, they said, do you think you could do that? And we're like, we'll do fucking anything for you. That eventually we left them. And that is what, when, you know, Sergeant Major came and talked to me, and I was a very seasoned senior team leader by then. Hey, we're standing up this new unit. It's got freaking SOCOM dollars. We love you. We want you to stay. Let's, let's have you enlist again. Bonus is awesome. It wasn't even on my mind. Something in me had broken. My vision of America, my vision of good and evil, my vision of my world, my whole world view was broken. I, I was now in the really real world and I was not quite equipped for it because it broke my heart. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, it, uh, you were, you were self aware of enough to essentially be able to, to look inward to the depths with which you, you understood that, that it was broken. Like yeah. you, you were aware of that. Yeah. Something happened brother. And, and, um, I was not the same. I, I was just, it just uh, broke my heart. And it's not that I was questioning uh, not just U.S. foreign policy and warfare and all of this, because, you know, warfare is the dawn, it is the nature of man. I know this. But damn, you know, we are good. We are good. And we are doing this for the good. But why can I not save these people? I could, so I call, I, I called. The hard base, you know, I called the, the rock and they knew very well that these people had been giving us information and, and, uh, and that I had, I had used their water tower, the only water tower in this little ville, El Karma outside of Fallujah. They had, I trusted my lives in these people's hands in the middle of the night. If they could have talked to the freaking, uh, to the freaking Mujahideen and, and Al Qaeda and they could have, they could have gave us, gave us up and they probably could have got money and they could have freaking killed us. They gave me everything. And, and I, I called, uh, I called higher and I said, we need to get this family out of there. Two of their kids are already killed or livestock slaughtered. There's an UXO IED in their house. Half of the house is blown up. I've already called an EOD. We've got a big cordon going around. It's middle of the day. The mother is running to me. She's got these tattoos on her mouth and, She's saying, you know, in, in Arabic, she's saying, why, you know, why, you know? And, uh, and I said, we need to get them out of here. We need to get this mother and father and, and their remaining children out of here. Let's get them out of here, man. And they're like, son, Ray, it's not your problem. I said, what do you mean? It is my problem. I gave my word. These people, you know how, how much they've helped us. You know how much they've given us. And by the way, I've witnessed these freaking suitcases a million dollars going to all these other freaking dirt bags out here you think i haven't noticed this you don't, don't notice that all these cats i've been dropping off in abu Ghraib and kidnapping and these freaking and these iraqi policemen that i've been killing uh, with trojan horse you don't think i know how messed up all this is you don't think i know how how you none of you all have a fucking clue and these people are doing the right thing and we're and we're gonna leave them here Brother, you know, I, I was so close to just taking off all my kit and leaving my weapon and leaving it right there in the fucking dirt and going right back into that house and getting a weapon from them. And just I, I just thought, well, maybe I should just stay there and fight to the death with them because the death squads are coming that night. But, you know, I was so tired. I think this is why I had that. I had, I had this secret, ugly shame inside of me because... Actually, I was right there, but then I thought, Rudy, you're so tired. Don't you just want to go home? Because I was leaving the next week. Don't you just want to go home? Shouldn't you just go home? And I said, okay, I'm going to go home. And that really bothered me. It's bothered me my whole life, and now it's gotten better. But underneath, I think when I was be doing movies or TV or, or, or doing counterterror, there was this deep thing inside of me that... Maybe when it mattered most, I was tired and I wanted to go home. A very human thing, but I couldn't really forgive myself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was really heavy, man. Yeah. Do you, I, do you have any idea what happened to him? Um, yeah, they were killed. Yeah. They were killed. 
Um, was that the single turning point for you where, where you realized that your humanity had kind of gone or, or was there a different time that that really clicked? I know you talked about, you know, your Sergeant major asking you, but was there a time before that, that, that was kind of that catalyst of understanding? Yes. Um, so I was always, you know, um, I've got a big heart. That's just the way I was made. And, and, uh, and, you know, I love animals. I have two cats and a dog at home that I adore. And um, I love children. Uh, we were taking fire in the middle of the day as we were doing a foot mobile patrol. And uh, this is outside of Fallujah. Or no, maybe this is in Ramadi. And uh, two adults ran to the river, got on a boat with weapons. My gun trucks hit them. And there was somebody else... Uh, another family member in the Ville was killed as we were doing fire maneuver. We get to the little Ville hamlet. It's on the, it's on a, a river a tributary and, um, and we're doing SSE and there is a naked, um, naked invalid, uh, genetically damaged child there naked. About how old? About 10. And scooting around on its naked ass because his legs didn't work. And I don't know if it was a boy or a girl because I didn't look at it too much because I had other shit going on. I'm the team leader of this freaking op and I got another team there too and we're doing SSE and, and we've got an engagement in the river and, I'm, you know, we got a lot going on. And uh, the child had blue eyes, really dark hair, light skin, and this light mustache on its mouth, but it might have been, I don't know if it was a boy or girl, but it uh, was mentally damaged too. So the child just going, wah, 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 crying, like, wah, wah, I can't talk. And then it's, it's scooting around and it's pawing on one of these other family members maybe or somebody. And I'm doing my freaking reports. I'm getting freaking word from this ear and this ear about the frago that I'm about to do. You know, I've got, you know, five more things to do. And um, I didn't realize that the, the, the little child that come close to me was grabbing a hold of my camis. And I just kicked this freaking child off me. And I'm working the radio. And then my Sark, my 18 Delta medic, who went on to be a pararescue and may seem Guy Kloffenegger, he looked at me like, what happened to you? You know, this isn't, you know, you know, he was incredulous. He couldn't understand looking at me because he know, knew me well. We we're swim partners. We we're best, best fucking brothers, um, training partners, teammates. And I just looked at him and I said, what the fuck are you looking at? I'd never been that piece of, that piece of me had never existed until then. And then that piece has never left me either. Now I understand it and, and I know how to put it where it needs to be. But that piece of me, and maybe, maybe that piece of you too, you may speak to it. Um, I know it's never left me. Is that piece, is it still in you too? For sure it is. I will, <laughs> okay. Yeah, but I, I will say, uh, and, and similarly, like there, there's, I, I think for double a personality capable men there has to to have or there has to be a place for that or, or you so. have to at least be capable of uh, bearing that that part of you. you you have to possess it you know because the world is an evil place and there there are times and situations that dictate its necessity yes however uh it's not very fucking often uh, and if it rears its head uncontrollably in any arena when it shouldn't, it'll be detrimental and, and it'll ruin you. Uh, and it's a hard thing to control sometimes. Um, I will say, at least for me, I, I tend to find myself being more empathetic uh, mm -hmm. may, maybe than most guys are towards uh, a lot of people, frankly, to almost to my own detriment where... Um, you know, may, maybe even getting taken advantage of in mm -hmm. certain instances because I try to give people the, the benefit of the doubt in most cases. But, uh, but I, I, I know exactly what you mean. And yeah. it's, it's heart, it's heartbreaking, uh, you know, to hear the, 
progressive nature with which it, it left, uh, you know, the empathy kind of left and, and this part of your character brought itself into, into existence. But, uh, man, that's, and you know, Mike, I think it's, I also very much appreciate it because I feel, especially since my resurgence in my Phoenix in the last five years, I feel it's with great responsibility that I have that knowledge of the dark part of life and the dark part of human nature. And with that knowledge and personal experience and even being that for a time, that is the lens in which I receive this world. And it's actually a, it's actually a, uh, a much more um, honest uh, piece of freaking optic to receive it. I now have that ability to know how hard and dark it can be and also to know people's nature. You know, I work in entertainment. People try to take advantage of me all the time, brother. Yeah. I'm in the middle of something right now. Um, by having that piece of hardness, true hardness, borderline darkness and borderline freaking evil, borderline hard, cold, um, no problem killing. Um, it better equips me to navigate this world, and it also makes me appreciate the love and the humanity and the compassion, the empathy that I have too. Yeah, miss the yin and the yang. Yeah, right? it, yeah, yeah. Uh, good, good isn't good without the context of bad. So true. Uh, it's a very prominent uh, component to dog training with mm. you know using positive reinforcement and and but there's a balancing act. You know there has to be consequence, et cetera. But, sure. Um, in all of your time throughout Afghanistan and the two deployments to Iraq, is there a mission that stands out to you as being the most memorable? And, and if so, if you could walk it through almost like a movie script. Okay, that. this is going to blow your mind. Actually, you've been around, so it may not blow your mind too much. You've been around. Wow. <laughs> wow. This is going to. Okay, so uh, you know my teammates on SAS, uh, Billy Billingham. The funniest, baddest ass dude. I call him badass Billy Billingham. And you know, they laugh at my American accent. Uh, para for 10 years, SAS 22 years, Sergeant Major at SAS. By the way, the best one-liners for everything. He's got so much experience. Uh, he's just the best, brother. Uh, and, uh, and then Foxy, SBS, 20 years, uh, Royal Marine Commando, SBS. That's their, like if... Like if SAS would be CAG and SBS would be DEV, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're all, uh, we do recons, whether we're in Jordan, Vietnam, uh, New Zealand. That's where we did our last one. And we always work together and do recons and then do uh, set up rope systems and stuff to prepare. It's a really super professional show. And we always talk, talk mess in the evenings. We freaking drink and talk and all kinds of stuff. And so uh, McChrystal and Billy worked side by side in Fallujah and in Iraq. Oh, wow. And um, and I said, well, you know, and he's telling me these badass stories and he's doing this and he's doing that. And I said, well, you know what? I got one for you, Billy. So we were in Ramadi and I was doing uh, Trojan horse. So I was uh, I'd dress up as a civilian contractor or dress up as a, like a Turkish laundry worker in the base because we had spies in the base that were collecting. And then uh, Iraqi police on the take would interdict us or other freaking uh, uh, Al Qaeda fucking Muj operators would interdict us, and they would get word that we're going out because we have to go in little bongo ta taxis with the with the orange panels, and we are a very soft target, right? And this was and think I mean only America, only good, God fearing, God loving, red blooded Americans that believe in freaking football. Um, you know, going to church on Sunday and uh, and freaking hamburgers, right? We'd be the only ones to think of this. The reason why I'm doing this, because I'm Mexican, right? So I, I looked Turkish. I could look like anybody I want. I wear a dish dash. I was wearing the garb. Dog, I am dressing up to be kidnapped and beheaded. <laughs> <laughs> in a freaking taxi. Now, of course, we freaking we had uh, we had um, NSA assets and uh, working through an ODA, and we put armor in the doors. 
we cut out the back seat so that my machine gunner is hiding in the trunk and can just roll into the back seat. There's no, uh, there's no up up part of the seat so he can roll and fucking hit from there because we're fighting right out of the vehicle oftentimes because these these policemen would freaking bang us and they'd be brandishing their weapons thinking oh they got us and then we freaking wait waste them brother close quarter at speed <laughs> watching the vehicles go 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 this is just a normal vehicle um yeah, yeah. A, a, a taxi do you remember oh, those yeah. you remember those those fucking taxis but they weren't they weren't outfitted with any kind of we cut some steel put them in the doors yeah. <laughs> Fucking body armor over the fucking window. Yeah, you know, and uh, and, and wow, only we would. And why we were doing this, Mike? Why? It's because we didn't want to hurt a single civilian. We wanted to draw them out, kill them, or capture them. We never captured anybody. We killed them all, and then take their phones and and then run signals intelligence on, on that, and then do DA hits at four in the morning to bomb makers, uh, you know, people funneling money, whatever. And we really shut that place down. But damn, brother, that's a lot of exposure. Yeah, I look, crazy. Yeah, I look yeah. back now, damn, that's a lot yeah. of exposure. Oh, 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 also, the, another thing I uh, never liked, red dot, you know, optics and stuff like that. And remember, in the old days, we all had to qualify on freaking iron sights, y'all. Iron sights qualify to include flat range. And then before you go into the house, you have to do it all iron sights, brother. You better shoot tight. And, and um, well, I had these new cool optics. That's a uh, really rad EOTech. Sure enough, if I, you know, I always turn it off when I'm not using it because I don't want to wear out the battery. So I forgot to turn that thing on. I fucking presented it up and, uh, and I'm like, well, I guess front sight tip. And so I just hit them. Um, <laughs> so needless to say at home we have a piss my little glock has a eotech on it and we leave it on i can always buy more batteries uh so uh I, i'm looking like um i'm looking like you know a latino freaking john wick and uh and uh in between doing trojan horse uh we also just get hot fills uh to do some recon or sniper missions so i'm in ramadi in this built-up area and you remember in iraq how there was some like almost finished nice homes yeah they were almost finished but they were nice i had to patrol about a click or two and we pushed the gun trucks clicks away but you know what brother i was always very conservative when i was fighting uh i made an interface with the tow guys with cat teams Attach these grunt cat teams. They were so hungry to work and they're kicking it with recon. They were living the dream because with those toes and the FLIRs uh, optics, they have fantastic for over there. Uh, and then always having tow missiles as an, as, uh, an asset is fantastic. Yeah. And we used them. So um, my buddy, Gare Gordable, the Basque G, Gare Gordable. We patrol, cover of darkness, we're on comms, we get to one of these really nice houses, and I'm just getting a fraggle, I mean, I don't even know what I'm doing, I know I need to get to this position, this insert point, I'm going to get to the objective, and then I'm going to conduct observations, be prepared for uh, uh, small arms, sniper, uh, uh, sniper mission, and CAS. Okay, great. Uh, got my sniper system, got my freaking assault rifle, uh, can mark it with my 203, um, uh, G's got an AT4 and his M4. And then we've got my teams about a click away. Patrol in, cover of darkness. We get into the, the hooch, this really nice uh, mansion, except if you recall, they had these out, outboard um, staircases. And sometimes there'd be no floors. And so if you fell off, and there's no rails on those things. If you fell off, that might be it. It could be curtains. So we're patrolling, patrolling, patrolling up there. We get onto the roof, you know, and we're freaking camied up. Bro, I took my camouflage so seriously, dog. I had a... Uh, I had a, uh, a desert colored boonie uh, that was actually like some duck camouflage that I repainted myself and faces all camied up. Brother, we always, we have fucking uh, uh, mechanics gloves that are in cami, you know, I got all my shit squared away, my fucking rifle set up and everything. And, and then I get a, a story or some, um, my commander, uh, Vaughn Krause. He's like, uh, hey, San Reyes, um, We've got army um, psych psyops rolling in. What do you mean rolling in? Are they going to walk? What's going on? So what am I actually doing here? Well, when the sun comes up, just wait and see. <laughs> I said, okay. Hey, G, let's set up our fields of fire. Here's this schoolhouse. 
uh, and there's some BMWs and Mercedes in there. There's some money here, yet everything else around it is very poor. More than likely, something's going to happen here. Uh, be prepared for targets of opportunity. And uh, so the sun starts coming up, brother. F finalizing dope, re relazing the freaking target, getting our freaking range finder squared away. Everything's ready to rock and roll. Me and G up there. And... The sun's coming up, and then first you hear the hee-haw, hee-haw, hee-haw of all the donkeys and the freaking roosters, and then you hear hum, da ha, la, la, the call to prayer, and then and then we hear boom. Look at each other. Wait, and I remember G had a little uh, disposable cameras. Remember, we could never use our freaking real shit for anything except work right but those disposable cameras you throw in your freaking cargo pocket so took a little picture of me and, and i'll show you the picture sometime i'm like it's kind of surprised because it just went bomb and then i'm hearing tracked vehicles and tanks in the perimeters of this area starting to move clink, 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 clink. and then um the ah, la, and then boom and then the sun's starting to come up, and then it's da 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 Moose starts flooding out, and then we start freaking firing into them. They're shooting rockets. Shit's blowing up everywhere. Everybody's <laughs> running all over the place. It's freaking hell's bells. is destroying the call to prayer. I mean, brother, this is out of control. <laughs> this is out of control. And uh, uh, and yeah, I, did, I, I hadn't thought about it until Billy was talking about uh, having this freaking super rad op with McChrystal's people with CAG and stuff like that. And and he was behind a little rock and taking heavy fire, but he decided, well, if I'm going to die, I'm at least make my tea first and then he freaking shwacked him with Casper. So so it was the fucking hell's bells, Dude, brother. That is hilarious. Wow. Is that some rock and roll shit it or is. what? And that's some shit out of a movie. What uh, to me I I would love to make ACDC aware of that. Like I'm curious what they would think. I wonder. You know? like, I wonder. Maybe they'd hate it. I don't know. Maybe yeah. They'd maybe think, they'd love it because yeah. it is quite rock and roll. You want to talk about yeah. counterculture, brother. How oh, about just sure. destroying all yeah. of them? Yeah. Well, <laughs> the but, yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, for sure it is. But, it, like, if you look at the progression of even, like, punk rock bands, yeah. it, like, at first they're the essence of punk rock, and same with heavy metal, and then yes. they get they get to a certain point, success and money-wise, where they're the exact fucking opposite. Yeah, you know? and, and I know. And ACDC, like, they're fucking billionaires at this point. I'm what, sure. Know, so. I wonder, man, we got to get that story to them before they pass, because yeah, they're getting be awesome. up in, yeah. up in age. Yeah, that would, that would be Yeah, awesome. Hell's Bells, that's brother. Awesome. Yeah, Amazing. so that's a good little op, yeah. uh, audience. Oh, I hope shit. you dig it. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> well, well told. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> And that led me to Call of Duty. And then now I'm doing Call of Duty, brother. Do you know I'm a character in Call of Duty? I didn't know that. Dog, I had no idea how big that is. <laughs>